What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very excited to be talking about helping men evolve. We have Dr. John Schinner joining us on the show. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm super pumped. This is going to be a lit episode. For those that don't know, Dr. John Schinner holds a PhD in educational psychology from UC Berkeley. He served as one of three expert consultants for Pixar's Inside Out. He is host of the Evolved Caveman podcast, teaching the latest tools for men's happiness and success, relationships, leadership, communication, physical health, and business. Find all the links in the bio below to guide to self.com, the evolved caveman.com, as well as his LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram profiles. All right, John, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? All right, direction of world. Um, I guess in general I'm concerned. I think there's some good and some bad out there. I think I'm encouraged by certain movements that are happening out there, positive psychology, appreciative inquiry. I see more volunteerism in a younger generation. All that's good stuff. Um, and then on the flip side, on the other hand, I think that I see a lot more anger than I've ever seen. You know, as someone who specializes in anger management, I just see it in our political parties. I see it in how polar polarized we are. I see it in how inflexible our thinking is and how we want to demonize others. Um, and so I'm concerned that if we don't get a handle on our own emotional state, that we're going to be in trouble. And this is why you care so much about getting mm -hmm. the handle on the emotional state. Yeah. Damn. Damn. Yeah. The, um, the, sh the sheer amount of lack of really wanting to get to people's hearts and wanting to ask them questions to understand them and how they got to their perspective versus the reactive anger immediately. Your yeah. worldview doesn't align with mine. Too bad. Yeah. It's over. That's it. So this, to be able to dive into humans deeper is something to get really passionate about. Okay, so then we're going to unpack some of these principles about how to do this throughout our conversation that you've been formulating and teaching people along the way. Let's do the journey. Okay. Okay. So born in the Bay Area in Walnut Creek, and then I want to know, how did you get hooked into psychology in your younger years? Okay. So um, I come from a strong German family with two parents that are successful, overachieving, kind of they're driven. And so I learned from a young age that in order to get their attention and their love, at least from my perspective, I also needed to be hard driving, overachieving, driven. And it led to me as a senior in high school, I was, I guess, killing it from the outside. I would played, you know, I was captain of three varsity teams. I was student body president. I was taking AP courses. And I'm sure from the outside, people thought, wow. Um, from the inside, however, it was a much different experience. I was stressed a lot. I was anxious a lot. I was depressed part of the time. I was sick a lot as a result of that. And it caused me to question this whole idea of success at the age of 17. Like, what is this success? Because I'm not feeling it right now. Like, where is there room for happiness or relaxation or contentment? And, you know, it, it, it worked. It got me into a really great college. I went to Pomona College. Um, and I kept going back to this idea of where's there room for happiness? And I majored in philosophy, um, which, prepared, <laughs> I'll joke, prepared me to do absolutely nothing. But Interestingly, it, it kind of came full circle 20 years later because with positive psychology, they're really concerned with answering that question that Aristotle asked thousands of years ago, what is the good life? Um, it took me a while to figure that out. But in any case, you know, I, I got into UC Berkeley in a PhD program in psychology. And one of the reasons psychology interested me was because I knew that I had been a pretty smart kid growing up, but where I got hamstrung was with my emotions. Um, I've always been someone that feels things deeply, and I was really confused by these emotions that I couldn't quite manage. And so I got into psychology really with the selfish interest of how do I manage myself? And Cal was all about cognitive psychology, so it's all about how we think. Um, so I had to actually wait till I got out of Cal to do more research on emotion. Um, and, you know, I remember I was a school psychologist, I was probably 26, 27, and no one really prepares you for getting into the field in the sense that most of us that get into the field are empathetic. And so you pick up people's emotions quite easily and readily. And if you're dealing with people that are depressed or anxious or angry, guess what? You pick up their emotions. 
And so it, it ended with me. I remember I was in my office. I got depressed because I was just hearing these heavy stories over and over again. When you're depressed, the inflammation in your body goes up. So my back goes out. So I'm in pain. I'm depressed. I'm like, okay, this makes no sense. Like here I am a psych trained at Cal and I can't manage my own emotions. If I can't do it, who can? And how do I teach them to? So at that point I started looking for the best scientifically proven tools, because that's my background from Cal, to manage that darker side of the mind, mainly fear, anger, sadness, guilt, shame. And, and it worked, that was you know, part of the equation. It was helpful, it wasn't the whole thing. Um, fast forward, I got into an entrepreneurial venture that did well for a bit and then failed. I had to reinvent myself, and at that point I started getting into positive psychology, which is basically the scientific study of human happiness. And that was life-changing. I mean, it was like manna from heaven. It was amazing. And I thought, wow, you know, now I've got tools to turn down the volume on the negative, turn up the volume on mm -hmm. the positive. Mm -hmm. This is powerful. I need to share this. Mm -hmm. So I started sort of compulsively writing. I wrote a like 600 page rough draft of a book of how to coach people towards a successful and happy life. Mm -hmm. um, happened to go to a Christian businessman's networking breakfast in the city. Happened to sit next to a guy who owned a radio station. And you know, Christian networking events kind of a weird place for me because I consider myself spiritual but not a big fan of organized religion. So, you know, I believe in a higher power, I just don't like other people really telling me how to do it because I've throughout the years found flaws in what they're saying generally. Um, anyways, we, I met a few times with this guy and uh, he said, John, I want to put you on the air. I want to give you your own show. And I thought, oh shit. The, the thought terrified me. Um, because it was a huge radio signal. It reached 10 million people. It was a daily primetime live show that he was talking about. But I also knew when you're dealing with anxiety that you have to go after it. Like that's the best way to deal with it. So I said, sure. Um, <laughs> did a radio show, was not very good at the beginning, was pretty stiff. Learned how to kind of tell a story and emote and tell a joke in a vacuum and got better at it. Got to interview some world-class experts. Um, and then after a year opened up private practice um, and, you know, I, I opened up with a positive psychology kind of focus, which was, I kind of got a lukewarm response. And I talked to a psychiatrist friend of mine and he was like, well, you know, what we really need is someone to do anger management in the valley. Mm -hmm. I was like, hell, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'll, I'll combine anger management with positive awesome. psychology. Because if you're trying to, you know, reduce the frequency of anger, it's my belief you need something to put in its place. And I would mm -hmm. say that's positive emotions, mm -hmm. positive thoughts. Um, you know, and, and so things started picking up. I created this online anger management class. Um, and initially it was for men because the people guiding me said, find a niche. I'm like, well, there's gotta be millions of men out there that need these tools, but maybe aren't brave enough to come in and see someone or don't have the money to come see someone weekly or aren't nearby. Mm -hmm. A couple of things that happened, <laughs> happened that were kind of funny. As soon as I went live with that, I started getting hundreds of emails from angry women all around the world. Whoa. And they were like, hey, buddy, we're pissed off, too. What about us? We're pissed and I was off, like, too. It's not, a, it's not personal. Like, it wasn't about you. Like, they told me to find, you know, it's like, <laughs> so I was kind of backtracking. And so I had to make it gender neutral. Um, and then the other thing that was pretty fascinating is I got this email. And this was, I don't know, eight years ago. And it said, dear Dr. Shinner, I've uh, been in prison for 27 years, been addicted to meth and PCP for as long. Uh, I no longer wish to be the man I once was. Uh, turned my life around six years ago. Thanks for the free anger classes. Wow. Um, Profound. And I was like, yes. I, so I don't know who this guy is, right? So I just, you know, fire off an email. Hey, good job turning your life around. Keep up the good work. I go to see a client. I come back. There's a response from him within an hour. I'm like, what's up? Like, who has email access in prison? He says, Dear John, this isn't my real name. My handlers won't let me use my real name. Check out the books, The Black Hand and Urban Street Terrorism. That's me. Once you do a little research, I'm sure you'll understand why. I was like, okay, this guy's really good because now I'm hooked, I'm curious. Uh -huh. So I check out the book, The Black Hand. It's about this guy, Rene Boxer Enriquez, who is involved in the Mexican mafia. Um, and I think he got out of it, you know, six years prior. So I, I got to work with him for a while, um, which, was a fascinating yeah. story in and of itself um, and created a little anxiety in me as well. Um, anyway, I, I won't go too far into Whoa. that story. But um, 
So I want, I want to okay, I want to play on a couple things as we got to where we're at. So one of the things that you're talking about earlier is like immediately going from the PhD in educational psychology into school counseling, and then realizing that now you're taking on the load of tons of different various emotional states of young mm -hmm. people on a daily basis, one after the other. Mm -hmm. And like, are we actually trained for that is like a great question. And how do we actually balance these tools? Like you said, positive psychology, anger management, mm -hmm. how do we learn? Only later did you really start like unpacking these tools and better understanding them. Yeah. Okay. So then um, give us the bit on um, positive psychology and anger management and how they've been relating to the clients that you've now been working with and seeing, especially the men. Uh, okay. So typically when I see, I'll see male adolescents or male businessmen and they're coming in with some degree of stress or some degree of anger, irritability is a common one. And so part of it is teaching them about anger. For instance, um, you know, one of the first places I'll go is breaking down anger to three different spectrums or axes. So, you know, if you think of what's the diff, D-I-F, you've got duration, intensity, frequency. Mm. So duration, how long does it last? When you get angry, are you, is it three minutes? Is it three hours? Is it three decades? Because we can hold on to grudges pretty well too. I is intensity, that's normally how we think of an emotion. So think of it on a one to 10 scale with one being calm and 10 being incredible Hulk enraged. And you know, so how intense is it getting when you're getting angry? And then frequency, how often does it come up? Um, and so you, you know, as you begin to kind of parse it out, you can look for improvement on any one of those areas. Um, and then part of it is relaxation exercises, stress management techniques. Part of it is finding out what your triggers are and being aware of those in the moment. Part of it, I think, is spending more time in the present moment because most of us go through life as an automaton. We're kind of on autopilot and we're not really aware of our inner processes and what drive us. And we are truly creatures of habit. Yeah. And those habits can be good or bad. Yeah. Most of them are just, you know, I mean, like if you think about drinking, um, you know, I remember I was dating a, a woman a while back and she was sober and it caused me to look at my drinking. Oh yeah. And I would reach for a vodka soda and I'd be like, do I really need this? Like, mm. why am I drinking this? What am I getting out of this? Mm. And you know, so that kind of process of just awareness in the moment of why am I doing this? Yeah. Um, Repatterning habits that mm -hmm. way. When you surround yourself with people that are countercultural in mm -hmm. a sense, it gives you another layer of insight into your own yeah, patterns and behaviors. Yeah. And, and so then, you know, I, I pulled in the positive psychology piece because my belief is when you tr when you start to reduce the intensity, frequency, and duration of something like anger, it creates a vacuum. And if you don't find something else to put in there, oh. the anger comes back. Oh, whoa. Okay. Okay. The, it creates a vacuum. So when when I have a uh, a duration of anger that moves from three hours to one hour, mm -hmm. there's a, you, you, there needs to be something that fills the other mm -hmm. two hours. So I, I need yeah, I don't know yeah. if it's that linear, that, that linear, precise, but it's, but it's I'm that idea. But I'm feeling what you're, yeah, yeah. what you're putting down there. And so then, how does one then work with positive psychology with that anger management practice? And so there's a, I mean, you know, there's three pages of tools to you know kind of answer that question. But in general, you know, one of the pieces is learning what the positive emotions are so that you can be better at spotting them in the present moment and savoring them. In other words, extending them in time. Yes. So for instance, you know, we know that positive emotions are fleeting and fragile, Yeah. which means that they don't last long. They're quiet. And if you overthink them, they go away. And you know, we know that the negative emotions are loud. They scream at us, right? So you know when you have a problem, but you don't necessarily know when you're relaxed. A lot of times they'll go, hmm, I'm tired. Mm. Um, you don't really have much recognition of when you're feeling awe or elevation. You mm. know, when, when you see someone else do an act of moral courage, it, it kind of gives us this feeling of a, a swelling in the chest, the shoulders pull back, chin goes up, and we're inspired watching someone else's moral courage. So it's, you know, there's a number of positive emotions that we can be aware of and learn to look for and cultivate or create the conditions to experience them more frequently in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, I mean, there's meaning, there's relationships, there's, there's a number of aspects to this, but that's one aspect. That's excellent. So it's having this meta perspective on the body, mm -hmm. on the feeling. And so to be able to see that 
from, from a third person perspective, okay, there's the anger that's being triggered. Now, how long is this anger gonna stay here? Am I really aware of this anger? Same thing with that. If I feel something that's super profoundly positive, if I'm really in a deep state of flow, can I take a pers quick moment to look at myself in flow and be like, wow, okay, mm -hmm. this is. Whoa. When, you know, you talk about flow state, like if you're in a flow state, whether you're playing guitar or, you know, jumping a bike off a 30 foot jump, if you stop to think, oh, I'm in flow state, or why am I so happy, you or why am I not thinking, it goes away, over, right? Yeah, overthink, yeah. And, and so part of this becomes, I think, you know, learning and cultivating the skill of mindfulness, you know, I see meditation on your wall mm -hmm. here, that we need to spend more time, we need to train our minds to spend more time in the present moment. Because there's, there's some early research that shows that we spend more than half of our time in the past and the future, and that wandering mind is associated with more misery. Damn, if 50% of our time is spent in the future and the past, that's nuts. Well, because normally we go to a negative past or a negative future. It's not, we don't go to a positive past and a positive future generally. We're going to negative uh -huh. on both. And that, yeah, because if we're going to a positive future, that's that future authoring that we want to keep with us right. on a moment to moment basis, even in the present. Um, okay, that's, this, is, this has been so, so fascinating already. Let's do... Um, Okay, on the way to um, getting to the Evolve Caveman, I want to hit on consulting for Inside Out. Okay. Because I think there's something about the way that we are disseminating multimedia content that needs the the needs the really strong storytellers, scientists, philosophers, the people that can help make sure that when the content gets disseminated that it really resonates with people, mm -hmm. that it that kind of stuff. So teach us about what this process was like with Pixar. Well, you know, it's, I, I mentioned that online anger management class. <clears throat> I've always been a, a geek and, you know, I've been able to program computers since I was 12 so I could throw up websites and blogs and I got my SEO pretty good for anger management. So when I did that online video course, it would come up high. So when Pixar needed someone on anger management, I guess they found me online. And I so, see you as that character right now, the one that's <laughs> like the red one with the... <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and so I, I get this call one day and she says, hey, this is a, an executive assistant here at Pixar. Could you speak to a producer here? I'm like, yeah, like I'm thinking maybe he's stressed or depressed. I don't know. And so he gets on the phone. And he says, hey, this is Jonas Rivera. I'm a producer here at Pixar. I produced this movie called Up. Maybe you're familiar with it. I'm like I'm trying to be cool. I'm like, yeah, I've heard of it. <laughs> and I, I knew I owned it, right? I had the movie at home because I have four kids. So I knew damn well I owned it. And I'm like, and I love Pixar, so I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah I think I've heard of it. Huh. And uh, he's like, oh, good. Well, he said, me and Pete Doctor, Pete directed up, we're working on a new project. And we were wondering if you'd come down and kind of kick some ideas around and brainstorm with us. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I can fit that in my calendar um, pretty much any time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, I got to go down there, and, and it was funny because you go in and you get this tag, and you know it's got the aliens from Toy Story on. It says, "Ooh," and out a, a visitor from the outside. And, oh, that's good. And I was just yeah. geeking out on all this. And there's this when you go into the Pixar campus, there's a building over here to the right where most visitors go, and they've got huge 3D statues of all their characters. And then there's the Brooklyn building. And I remember I was told to go to the Brooklyn building, so I'm walking there, and the security guard stops me and says, "You know, excuse me, sir, are you lost? You know, do." You, do you need some help? And I said, well, I'm, I have a meeting at the Brooklyn building. He's like, oh, okay, well, go on in. And I was like, so I go in, uh, and EA meets me at the door, and there's you know, a staircase, and there's a, the staircase is roped off and says, no one up the staircase without producer accompaniment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we go right up the staircase. We go into a room where there's you know, concept art for Inside Out, and you know, I think uh, Jonas meet, met me in there, and we're looking at the, the characters, and I was like, okay, I see sadness, I see joy. I see anger. I'm not really sure what you're doing with that one. And it was disgust. And it was like a huge nose that was kind of turned up. And um, so they, they had some issues with two of the characters, which we, you know, which I just picked out and said, mm, not sure about those. And then we spent a day with their top 12 people on the movie just discussing anger and emotion and um, the neuroscience behind it. Nice. And it was. It was incredible. These guys had done so much foundational research before I had even gotten in the room. I was blown away, and and so just yeah. to have a just to have a hand in any Pixar film was really really flattering. That one in particular, I think, has done a tremendous job of educating a generation of kids 
that we have voices in our head, the voices don't always make sense, that we have emotions, the emotions don't always make sense, and to work to accept them um, and to be able to label them and give them a language to talk about them in, which I think is immensely valuable. Yes, yes. The, and like you said, the amount of research that was done even before you were getting in there, there, there were 12 people that were already working on this. They had already under, the, built out the characters, had built out like corpuses of knowledge mm -hmm. on every single one of them. So, and that's why it resonates so deeply for, for, again, this for the dissemination of it. And then, like you said, it's just so critical that then we have these, a deeper understanding of double clicking into the emotions within mm -hmm. our bodies, thanks to content like this. So... What a, what, a, what a cool, I really look forward to more content that enriches us like that. Yeah. That's like high signal content and I'm obsessed with high signal content. It doesn't content. get any better in my mind. I mean, because it's entertaining and educational yeah. and it's entertaining in a, a, at a level. I mean, I, like, I remember I went into this meeting and I said, you know, it's kind of funny to me that you want to talk to me and you want me to teach you about emotion because you guys are the best in the world at evoking emotion in others. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I should be sitting here picking your brains. Mm -hmm. What do I have to teach you? I, I don't know, I'm, I'll give it a shot, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so cool that you got to do that. Um, all right, let's do, let's go into some, some of the assets we have for helping men evolve. Okay. Can, so, yes. I have a question. Yes, Ron. Okay. Is there any room for negative energy or anger in this new world ahead of us? Absolutely. I, I mean, you know, one of the things that I'll talk about with clients is we're not, the goal is not to eliminate anger. The, the goal is to feel anger, to be aware of it in the moment, and to use that to assert yourself, ideally in a calm way, to, to state your needs. But, I mean, without anger, I mean, think of all the social justice movements in the world. Like, without anger, none of those exist. Mm -hmm. Without anger, we get walked all over. Mm -hmm. Without anger, we're not alerted when our boundaries are trespassed. Mm -hmm. um, so anger serves a very important function. All emotions do. It's just that we're very crude at how we handle our anger. Uh, we're cavemen. Yeah, yeah, this is well said. Serves such an important purpose, but we're kind of crude mm -hmm. at, yeah, cavemen still. Yeah, this kind of, uh, the, the paleolithic uh, understanding of our uh, bodies and biologies and neurophysiologies, all that stuff, versus the today's day and age with the information technology and the newsfeed and the algorithms, they're just incompatible, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And, so, and, and one of the things, yeah. if I can loop back to this, because one of the dynamics that I see with anger that really concerns me is, I, you know, I work with a lot of men that, that are angry and anger, when you're angry, if, if we're in an argument and we're really angry at each other, it's none of it's my fault. Anger's all about externalizing blame. And so if you think about that and you play that out and you've got men that are chronically irritable, nothing's their fault. They don't need to change a thing. The problem is with everyone else out there. And if the world would just change, or if women would just change, or if protected groups would just change, I'd be okay. And it's a very unrealistic approach. It, it shuts down learning. And, and so I think once you become aware of that dynamic, it can help you to get out of it. Um, the other thing that I talk to a lot of people about is if we're in an argument and we're raising our voices and starting to yell at each other, nothing I say is going to get into your head. And nothing you say is going to get into my head. So the point of arguing at that point you know, when you're mm -hmm. really getting escalated yeah, above a yeah. five on that intensity scale, it, it's yeah. pointless yeah. at some point. And so when you realize that too, it's like, oh, okay, I need to work to bring it down so that I can potentially influence you to see my, what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And taking the break to go walk outside and stuff like that, yeah. um, all different types of things, a workout. Um, yeah, breathe yeah, deeply. Breathe deeply. Reframe. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. This is so critical. Let's. We have some great assets. Okay. Um, let's let's pull them up because this also has to do with that um, history. So let's do the first one, Ronnie. Okay. Um, so how men are socialized? Yeah. So walk us through this. Okay. So back in the 1980s, Paul Kibble was doing some work in Oakland with uh, men that had engaged in domestic violence, and he started asking them questions about what their experience was like growing up as a man, and he found some commonalities. 
and part of it is that we're, we're socialized to be invulnerable, we're socialized not to feel, we're socialized um, to dominate women, to be aggressive, to not back down. There's a number of things to it. But the way that's done is this man box culture where generally men police themselves. We're policing ourselves and you know, growing up, a lot of, for a lot of men it's their dad that's saying this stuff. If it's not your dad, if you were lucky and your dad was pretty cool and had a more open mindset, I guess, then it's your friends. If it's not your friends, it could be a sports coach could be a teacher, it could even be females around you. I've had, you know, teenage clients recently that, you know, they'll, one guy said he was crying in front of his girlfriend and his girlfriend said, stop being such a pussy. But we get these insults of, you know, man up, stop being a little bitch, don't be a pussy, don't be a fag, don't be so gay. And these things have been around for, since I was a kid. Um, and I, you know, I'll tell my clients when they come in, like, Look, if you think back to your childhood, I can effectively eliminate two-thirds of the emotional spectrum for you with two phrases. If you show too much sadness or fear, stop being a pussy. Psh, bang, gone. If you're smart, if you're sensitive, you learn that lesson real quick. We don't like to be humiliated, we don't want to be embarrassed, and we'll pick that up fast. Then if you show too much excitement, joy, love, romanticism, don't be so gay. Psh, so what are we left with as men? We're left with primarily anger, some degree of anger, annoyance, irritation, rage. And then, you know, I would say there's also, we can cop to stress because I can be, I can use stress to show how successful I am. Look how busy I am, I'm stressed. Um, and then I think there's also something like lust in there. Um, but so everything that we feel gets channeled and redirected through the lens of anger. Damn. Uh, the, so on the everything kind of like emotionally connecting to others, let's say, is kind of like on the don't be the pussy mm -hmm. side, and then everything on the on the like maybe a, an, another way of saying it's maybe on the like I'm connecting to sunsets or something. Mm -hmm. I'm connecting. Uh, don't be so gay. Mm -hmm. um, so so there's like wow that eliminates so much. So that programming at such a young age in culture, literally C U L T mm -hmm. cult. Sure, right? That, that is what programming has caused some of the megalomaniacs, some of the psychopathy that we have today, um, neurosis in men. Yeah, I don't know if it's caused it. I mean, I think it's exacerbated it. Exacerbated um, it, yeah. Some, I mean, some yeah. of it I think is biological or, or totally. um, organic. Plays a, plays a big role in it. Yeah. Um, would, you, would you, this is the man box mm -hmm. culture, right? Yeah. So you call this the the bot where it's like you can't feel don't feel that what you're feeling about the sunset right now or are you about to cry because you feel something like mm -hmm. don't feel that that's outside the box right okay. and so as soon as we step outside the box and show a behavior that you know another man doesn't like or is uncomfortable with they'll insult you to get you to jump back in the box yeah yeah yes that's that that's the feedback mechanism and, and yeah. part of the problem is that we're the way we're socialized we're not socialized to learn to communicate. We're not socialized to learn to be emotionally aware. We're not socialized to be empathetic. And so then you fast forward 20 years, 30 years, and you're in a relationship. And I mean, if you're, if you're straight, the women that we're with are like, I can't connect with my man. Like, let's he's bring not up, sympathetic, he's not communicative. Let's bring up the next asset for this part. Okay. Yeah. So these are the, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. And, and so back in the day, you know, it used to be sufficient to be a good provider, to not drink too much, don't do drugs and don't hit anybody. That was a good husband. Now the, the expectations, the job definition for husband has changed dramatically where, you know, women are looking for someone that's sympathetic, empathetic, communicative, emotionally aware, and they're confused as to why they're not getting it. But the job definition changed for us and nobody told us. And, and on top of that, we've been socialized in exactly the opposite way. So now we're in these relationships and our women are unsatisfied and you know, we're pretty easily you know, placated or we're, we're more easily satisfied. So if they were satisfied, we'd be okay, but they're not. And so I, I really think that we're at a point where if we don't learn to evolve as men, if we don't begin to learn some new skills and learn some open-mindedness, you know, it might be a bit of an exaggeration, but I think we run the risk of being superfluous because, you know, the, this change happened because women started getting out into the workforce, yeah. making more money. There's more political power there. And while it's still not even, they don't need us as much for that financial arrangement that used to be marriage. Mm -hmm. And so they're looking for more in a partner. They're demanding more. 
And you know, it's funny, I've had this conversation before with, with certain men, and a lot of men will get triggered and start, they get <laughs> angry, yeah. and they'll be like, well, how come I have to change? Like, why don't, why don't the women change? And it's like, well, unfortunately, they already have. Yeah, they're already upgraded. And now we're playing catch up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's on us to up our game and yeah. to up our skills. And, and all these are, are learnable skills. Yeah, yeah. Give us some, some of the key uh, strategies for um, the 2019 uh, uh, emotional intelligence attributes that we can be gaining in order to be better. Well, one of the things, I mean, I think, you know, when I was younger, I used to, you know, I was, as I said, I was smart. So I, I, a lot of my identity was wrapped up in my thoughts. And, you know, I, I was up here a lot in my head. And what I found some years later, embarrassingly, is that emotions are embodied. So they're mostly in our body from the head down. Mm. And, you know, Descartes really screwed us several hundred years ago when he said, I think, therefore I am. Because that statement essentially separated mm. mind from body. And, you know, I was a big fan of that statement when I was in college. And it took me a while to unlearn that and realize, okay, wait, I got to slow down and tune in to what's going on in my body. What's my heart rate doing? What's I feel my muscle slash tension? think, therefore I uh -huh. am. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, what's my jaw doing? Like, are my thoughts over focusing on angry things? Um, you know, am I perspiring? Like, and, and so you can look at these physiological cues. And one of the things I've got at my office is a, an emotion map where they ask 800 people to color in on a computer. Where do you experience in the body anger, fear, mm. sadness, anxiety, pride, happiness? And you can see these patterns very quickly. And where do people experience? Um, the, where do you find the patterns? Yeah. Well, anger, I mean, to me, anger is, it can be in the fists, because anger is preparing you to attack. Mm. So your blood rushes to your fists and your feet. Um, you might, some people get muscle tension in their forearm. Uh, the jaw generally gets tight. Um, you, the heart rate goes up. That's my biggest tell mm. that there's a negative emotion kind of coming up, that, you know, the heart rate will go up. And, and so it's, it's things like that that really help you to identify what you're feeling in the moment. The problem is you have to be in the present moment. Your attention has to be there in order to catch it. Because I've talked to a lot of men that are like, I don't know what happened. Like, uh, I just kind of woke up and the, the guitar was, you know, smashed into the wall. Like, and, and, you know, I hear that a lot. I go from zero to 60 and like, like that. Like, well, yeah, we know from research that you know, from stimulus to response for anger, it's, there's a third of a second between those a two. A couple hundred milliseconds. And, you, you know, people are like, well, that's no time at all. Well, yes, and that's enough time to insert a thought in there of, I, get, I need to get out of here, or I need to breathe deeply, or this isn't worth it. And with practice, you can extend that third of a second yes. to a half a second, yes. a second, five seconds. That's the repatterning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it re really requires this deep, surgical operation into that 300 millisecond yeah 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 can you really get to that point because if you can challenge yourself to be like i can get there i can do that then you can take a little bit more ownership and sovereignty yeah. over the way that we um let's hit on um some of the masks um that we have this is the mask of vulnerability yeah, and so, you know, the way that we're socialized, we begin, vulnerability, yeah, yes. we begin to wear masks to protect ourselves, to hide what we're actually feeling, what we're actually thinking, our hopes, dreams, aspirations. And, you know, one of the masks that we wear is this mask of invulnerability. So we're, we're trained over the years to not have any needs. So we're, and that's the, the idea of self-reliance. So men are supposed to be self-reliant. So I don't need anything from you. I can take care of it myself. Directions, I don't need to ask for directions. I don't need to know how to make love. I don't need to ask that. I'll just watch porn. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I don't need anything. I don't feel anything. I cannot be hurt. So you wear this mask of, you know, I guess it would be um, the, the downside of stoicism in a way. But, you know, it's yeah. the, we're always wearing that mask to appear like nothing bothers us. To we're balance in control. those two out is so mm -hmm. critical to have that, um, that bit of like, if you do know how to get to somewhere, you can be confident and mm -hmm. like help someone get to that place, but also to be vulnerable and when you don't know how to get somewhere and say like, hey, can you teach me how to get to this place? I don't know. And, yeah. and the problem with this is it, it eliminates our ability to ask for help when we need help. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And that's a problem. I mean, like if you're a depressed, isolated man in his 50s and you buy into this man box culture, 
You're just like, I, I gotta deal with this on my own. I gotta suck it up. I gotta gut it out. That's right. <laughs> I, you know. Oh, Ron, we love you. We love you. I love Chinese food. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's the mask of invulnerability. Let's, let's go to the next one. Okay. The mask of provider. Yeah, and so one of the things that, one of the ways we're socialized is to be a provider. That that's one of the things we get a, a huge sense of our identity. That, you know, I'm providing financially for the family. And again, if you look at any of these ideas on a one to 10 scale, it can be a problem if you go too far on the extreme. So if you're not providing anything, that's a problem. If, you're, if you become a workaholic and you're gone from your family you know, 100 hours a week, that's a problem. I mean, why are you working 100 hours a week? Well, I'm working for my family. Well, do you see your family? No, not really. I'm too tired when I'm with them and then I'm just back to work. How much sense does that make? And, and I see it all the time. I, I deal with men that are worth $200 million or $50 million, I mean, more money than you can spend in a lifetime, and they're working 100 hours a week. The doctor has said, if you don't find a way to manage your stress, you're going to die. And they're working now to make more money for grown adult children that won't talk to them because they were such a lousy father in the past. And it's like, why are you doing this? Patterns and behavior. And, and, and yeah. part of it is they, they don't know who they are if they stop. Yeah, yeah, and they're yeah. afraid that Oh yeah, it, it's all going to come crashing down, catching up with them. They're afraid of depression. They're afraid of the loss of identity. Um, so yeah, it's 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 an issue. Mm, 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 mm. The mystery of when we depattern uh, and unpattern and re and change our behaviors of the mystery of oh I don't know what I'm gonna yeah become. Well, and, yeah. and that's why you know I've told them that look you were sold a bill of goods and the bill of goods goes something like this: get good grades, get into a good college get a good job, start making money, get a wife, have kids, make more money, move up the ladder, and then you'll be happy. And when I see them, they're 50, and they're like, I'm not happy, I'm miserable. Like, what happened? Well, you didn't learn the skills to cultivate happiness. You know, you, you bought into this, this pipe dream that doesn't pay out. And, and that's why, to me, like, you know, going back to that idea when I was 17, like in this idea of success, where's happiness? Because happiness is really, to me, something we're all after. I think everyone on this planet mm -hmm. is after happiness. And, you know, we go about it different ways. Wealth, fame, power, sex, drugs, serving others, having a mission. Mm -hmm. But most of the ways that we go after it are highly misguided. I mean, the, the top two values for the younger generation are wealth and fame. Ooh, that's not going to lead to their happiness. Damn, yeah, not meaning and purpose mm -hmm. fulfillment. Well, I think there's, it, was that actually ranked by like the Gen Z's that way, that wealth yeah. of fame? Damn, damn, because there's also so many of them that also care about like, True. yeah, yeah, leaving that this for meaning and purpose. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also like balancing these things out is, um, especially for, for men is really critical because you do want to um, have a North Star and achieve purpose and mm -hmm. um, achieve being able to take burdens on your back and go forth and stuff. But at the same time, it's um, to be able to uh, also have that radical, open, honest, vulnerable conversation with yeah. your partners and your families and stuff like that. Well, and I think one of the, to, to dovetail on that, I think one of the things I would love to see is men being more supportive to men. I yeah. mean, think of when, when's the last time a man paid you a compliment? I, I remember, I, I can think of, I, I have a, a guy that I know that's early 20s and he came in and, and I said, wow, your hair looks really nice today. And he's like, fag. <laughs> <laughs> Ron laughed. And, and I was like, what? okay, so apparently you don't take compliments very well, which is universal for men. Like we don't deal with compliments well. We don't give compliments to other men. We're not supportive to other men. And this is why we've had like several conversations on the show about what it's like for men to identify women that are like spiritually and emotionally connected. Yeah. Um, and then like men usually just go and hang out with women that are yeah. in that capacity because then they can open up and be vulnerable and understand their own emotions and feelings with women. Um, but with men, it's like, yeah, it's, it's pr literally pr yeah, programmed into the vibe 
um, until you find these men that are like, whoa, emotionally yeah. connected. And then it's like, <gasps> oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah, that's a, like, I just melt, you know, it makes me feel great. <laughs> and so I've, you know, going to events like that is fantastic. Okay, let's hit um, the next one, the mask of apathy. Yeah, if, if you want to, if you're in a relationship and you really want to piss off your, your spouse or your girlfriend and she asks you a question, reply with, whatever. Ugh. Or, sure. And, you know, I, I think this is another way that we protect ourselves. It's, it's a non-committal response. It's that I don't care piece. Or I don't really have much of an opinion, so I'm not going to go either way. And, you know, I think one of the things that a lot of women want is a man that can plan and even has an opinion on, like, where do you want to go for dinner? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this is one of the things in talking with women that I hear quite a bit. And there's these little, subtle, non-committal responses that we make that can drive them a little bit nuts. Yeah, def, def, no matter who, like, yeah, just responding with whatever, so what, nobody cares. Like, those words are like, there can harm the vibe between yeah. humans, period. So, yeah, be very vigilant. With, well, what does whatever yeah. mean? Does that mean yes? Does that mean no? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the last mask of affluence. Yeah, and I think this one really... Um, speaks to how we're socialized in the sense that most men are very competitive and we're always in a constant competition of one-upsmanship and you know I, I've talked to a lot of guys entrepreneurs that you know I'll bring up the idea of masculinity and they're like oh no 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 like I don't have a problem with masculinity or femininity like I'm fine like I have no problems with masculinity all right fair enough like no problem and then you know a few minutes later we're talking about how he loves going into a club with a woman that's a 10 on his arm. And I'm like, so what do you get out of that? Well, I like to see the other guys jealous. I like them to look at me. I like them to be envious. I'm like, and you don't think that's tied into your masculinity? And then he's like, uh, well, maybe. I mean, you know, we're always, we're comparing biceps. We're comparing looks. We're comparing, you know, the sports car. We're, how much money do you make? Um, and we, we know that those upward social comparisons, when you compare yourself to someone who's better off than you in some way, creates a feeling of being less than, and you know, to some extent, misery. Or people that um, think that somebody's less than because they have less is problematic as well. That's yeah, and I think that's good the flip point. side. Yeah. yeah, good point there too. Oh. Yeah, good point there too, and then footnotes, it's a good one. Um, and it's it's transitioning away from the triangle with decentralization technologies to the circle mm -hmm. and it's like people that are in positions of power right now that are trying to cling to corruption are like old that's old code that's dying right now yeah. and and they're struggling yelling screaming for power to and now democratization of technologies are enabling people to just be like no like that's not happening anymore. We're moving away from that. So, we and hope. I think, all, yeah, we, we we're on the, yeah, on our way. Yeah, that's good. And then the last asset, um, explain what this is for us. Um, okay, so this is a, a framework that I'll teach my clients usually the first session. So on the top half of this, you've got positive past, positive present, positive future. On the bottom half, you've got negative past, negative present, negative future. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, <clears throat> pardon me, that I try and get across <clears throat> is the idea that <laughs> your mind can screw with you, to put it politely. Um, your mind isn't always your best friend. Your mind isn't always on your side. That sometimes there are voices in your head that are complete bullshit, honestly. And, you know, we know that <clears throat> because we've done studies where you, you can put someone at the edge of, like, the Grand Canyon, and they're looking down, and it's a mile down, and if you were to step or jump into the Grand Canyon, you would die, because it's a mile down to solid rock. And inevitably, most people will have some sort of thought that says something like, jump. Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, that flies in the face of everything we know about self-preservation mm -hmm. and natural selection. So we know that we have these thoughts that <clears throat> don't serve us. And most people, <clears throat> pardon me, um, spend most of their time on the bottom half of this chart. So negative present is kind of a pessimistic interpretation of the current moment. 
And you know, if you look for the worst in people and situations, you can find it because it's there. Um, but we know that pessimism is closely related to depression and irritability. Mm. Um, every pessimist that I've met says the same thing. I'm not pessimistic. I'm realistic. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and the funny thing <laughs> yeah. is that they're absolutely right. Yeah. Like they're dead on yeah. accurate. Yeah. And what we found is that pessimistic people actually see reality a little bit more accurately than optimism. Than completely blind optimism, sure. But it comes at a cost, and the yeah. cost is greater misery. Yeah, yeah. So there's a choice. And That's funny. You know, just so you know, be a realist. you can be more miserable yeah. or you can be more optimistic. Yeah, yeah. To me, it's no, no choice, but. I th it feels as though realism, even though it does come with that, uh, it, it has a truer essence of a world view because it does see some of the issues on the planet that still need to be um, taken care of, things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think you can still be optimistic and see, and those, see those issues things. Yeah, and see great. solutions to get out of True. them too. Yes, yes. Um, Yes. You know, I don't think it means foregoing that. And realism doesn't mean having pessimism either. Realism can be uh, just realism without, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so then, you know, the mind kind of takes you against your will to the negative past, bad stuff that's happened to you in the past, tragedies, mistakes you've made. And we know that the more time we dwell there, the more likely we are to be depressed and feel regret. So I don't spend a whole lot of time in the past with my clients unless there's something huge that needs to be, that they need help kind of finding the meaning in or the silver lining. Um, and then the mind takes you against your will to the negative future. So you're worrying, that's kind of the area of worry, dread, um, stress, anxiety, and it's you know, imagining all the bad things that might happen in the future. Um, and then you know, on, the, on the top end, we know that the more time you can spend on those top three, Mm. the more satisfied you'll be with life. So mm. positive past is something I don't think most of us spend a lot of time in mm. compared to the negative past. Yeah, yeah. But you can cultivate that skill. And you know, the way to do that is with the mental scrapbook exercise, which is simply come up with three exercises or three memories that each have a positive emotion attached to them. That's great. The photo of my mom holding me after she gave birth <clears throat> to me, like, holy cow, that one's been a powerful one, you know? Yeah, or a good grade on a test or, you know, a, a championship win in a, in a sport that you played or a hug that you got. Or, I mean, for me, one of them was coming face to face with a giant sea turtle while I was snorkeling. Yeah. Because it fills me with awe. Oh, that's great. Um, yes. But, you know, you can, you can practice kind of consciously, mindfully pulling those memories up and they give you a slight emotional boost. And you can post some of them around, as pictures mm -hmm. around your yeah, living spaces. And that's huge. You wake yeah. up and you look at that and you're right away, you're vi revisiting positivity yeah. around you. Yeah, that's huge. And then positive present is cultivating more realistically optimistic uh, mindset and perception. And that's a whole hour long talk that I can go into mm -hmm. another time. Mm -hmm. um, but basically we know that the more you cultivate optimism, the more satisfied you are with mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm and positive future, which again, I don't think most of us spend a lot of time there thinking about where do I wanna go, where do I wanna be? And the exercise there is called the best possible you, where you just imagine yourself five years from now and imagine that everything's gone as well as it possibly could between now and then, given those conditions, where would you be in five years? Who would you be hanging out with? Would you be married? Would you, you know, what would your friends be doing? Where would you be living? What car would you be driving? What job would you have? And I think the more that we can focus our mind on that sort of picture, we increase our probability of getting there. Yeah, that, that's the future authoring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And taking the small incremental steps we need to, to get there. Um, also, just because we didn't um, get to the statistic, I just want to say that another one of the reasons why you care so much about um, uh, helping men as a men's peak performance coach is because 75% um, of divorces right now are being initiated by women. Right. And so that was an interesting point that um, you told me beforehand that mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that, that we at least mentioned. So, um, okay, let's ask you a couple quick questions on the way out, John. Okay. Um, let's ask, uh, do you think that we're alone in the cosmos? No. Um, statistically, I, I think that there has to be some other sentient life out there. I mean, we've found too many planets that at this point have the possibility of hosting life. And I, I think it's arrogant to assume that we're the only ones that, are, that have intelligence. Then what do you think happens pre-birth and post-death? Oh. Um, I like the idea of transmigration of souls. Um, that, and you know, I, I can't prove it, but I find it comforting. So I, I think there are things that come up from past lives um, I've seen too much to suggest that that's a possibility. 
Um, Post-death, I like to think that there's something within us, if you want to call that soul or spirit or energy, that exists beyond us. Um, partly because I find that a comforting thought. It's, it's funny, there's a difference in me rationally and emotionally. Rationally, you know, kind of the scientist in me says, oh, there's no proof for that, there's no way that could be. Emotionally, it's a choice that I make because it, I find it comforting. Mm -hmm. And then do you think we're in a simulation? You know, I, I think there's a lot of um, physics that points to that as a strong possibility. Um, I find I don't spend a lot of time thinking about that because my mind kind of kinks and like stops functioning a little bit. Like it's too far down the rabbit hole for me. <laughs> and then uh, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? You know, I, I think the most beautiful thing in the world is positive emotions, um, connection, relationship, joy, love, awe, gratitude, forgiveness, compassion, self-compassion. Um, yeah, that, that laughter. I mean, just that point of mm. connection mm -hmm. where we can completely let down our guard and let other people in and connect. Wow. Yeah carrying those with us on a daily basis and having a world that is just like obsessed with those emotions yeah. would be like, wow. Yeah, it'd be totally different. Totally different, I love it. Sean, this has been such a great episode. Thank you, thank you, thank uh, you for my pleasure. coming on. Thank you for Thanks for having us. me. Yeah, this has been super cool. We still have a lot to understand about how we can get to you know, peak performance and, and uh, understand the emotion, the feeling within positive psychology mm -hmm. and uh, anger management. Such a good, such a good conversation. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Give us your thoughts. Also, do share more conversations with your friends, your families, coworkers, online on social media. Get talking more about positive psychology, anger management, peak performance, the relationship between men and women that we're evolving into. So get talking about this more. Check out the links in the bio below to the work of John, guidetoself.com, theevolvecaveman.com. Also his LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram profiles. Go and check those and follow them out. And also shout out to Ron Vargas for producing and directing. Thank you very much and support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support simulation, our links are below. Help us grow and prosper as well. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you so much. Thank you for tuning in and we will see you soon. Peace.